Today we have a professor Krzysztof Gajow from Harvard. Finally, some, someone can see my name. <laughs> that happens. Uh, and uh, uh, Professor Gajow is a Gordon McKay professor in com computer science in the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. Prior to uh, being at Harvard, uh, he got his um, PhD from UDA, computer science. He's been also a postdoc at Microsoft Research after getting PhD. And he got his BSc Bachelor and Master of Engineering from MIT. He has uh, received many awards, best papers, and so on. Uh, I'm not going to list them all, but I will just mention one distinction that his work was recognized um, as the most impactful paper award from the Intelligent User Interfaces uh, ACM conference in 2019. That was his work on automatic generating personalized user interfaces, which I think was your dissertation work, correct? Okay. So, uh, and he will talk about human cognitive disengagement during AI assisted decision making. So, without further ado, to stop. And now we can, so we can go around the table and uh, ask our audience about backgrounds. So if you can very briefly tell me what discipline you, you come from, what we'll definitely decide where, what I should emphasize and what I could like to say. I will situate myself today in um, anthropology of critical data. Oh, all right. <laughs> Human computer interaction. Thank you. Information search behavior, search as a learning. Okay, thank you. Uh, computer science information retrieval. And information behavior uh, with a focus on how consumers are looking for health information on the internet. Um, search behavior focusing on creativity and creativity. Um, information behavior, especially cognitive bias. Thanks. Uh, human computer interaction with how they share Social informatics. Human information interaction. <laughs> And, and we have more than 15 people online, but we are not going to ask everyone. <laughs> um, all right, so thank you for the invitation. Um, uh, um, I, I lead the Intelligent Interactive Systems Group at Harvard. Uh, so we naturally focus on the intersection of uh, machine and human intelligence. And we, we, we study a variety of uh, questions. We have been for a long time very interested in systems that adapt themselves to, to their users. And in particular, we worked a lot with people with motor impairments and adapting building systems that adapt uh, themselves to, to people's uh, actual abilities. Um, and uh, we, we built creativity support tools, we, uh, we, uh, we built systems that help people learn. And these days, we work a lot with, uh, with AI assisted decision making. Um, I'm going to, to reveal all of the punchlines ahead of time. There, there are roughly four things that I'd like to uh, discuss. One is that uh, in a lot of our work on human AI interaction, we overestimate the amount of cognitive effort that we're going to get from our people. So everybody in this room already knows that we, we need to design interactive systems such that they're easy and effortless for people to use. But somehow, when we started putting machine intelligence into the systems, often to make systems easier and more efficient to use, we made assumptions about what kind of cognitive work people would be willing to perform to operate these user interfaces. And most of the time, we, we got it wrong. And I'll show you a range of examples. Uh, second, um, I'm going to challenge the, uh, the fundamental, fundamental assumption of how we do explainable uh, AI these days. I, I think that in many situations, it is a mistake to give people a decision recommendation. Instead, we should be supporting people in making their own well-informed decisions rather than trying to, uh, to, to do the decision-making for them. And even though we, we give people decision recommendations ostensibly to help them make their own decisions, but through, their, through the very fact of, make, of making these initial recommendations, we actually make it harder for people to engage with, uh, uh, with, with the problem. Next, uh, uh, I'm going to argue that we are 
we have made much less progress in explainable AI than we believe we have because most of the time we've been measuring wrong things and we've been getting overly optimistic results. And, uh, and finally, um, uh, let me just double check that I've, uh, I've instantiated the, the wrong version of it. <laughs> and finally, <laughs> um, uh, I, I believe that you know if we if we start paying attention to to all the little details that I mentioned before, and we we step back, we will discover that there are many opportunities for fundamentally redesigning uh, human and AI interaction. And I'm going to make my point by telling you a story divided into eight chapters. But I promise the chapters will be uh, relatively brief each, and there will be a, a dramatic arc with <laughs> suspense and you know uh, setbacks and all that. Uh, and I'll start uh, way back behind. Uh, by reflecting, you know, at, at how we as uh, as computer science, you know, enter the interactive world. This is uh, one of the first. This is the first version of Microsoft Word, and illustrates what our in early software looked like. It was uh, it was fairly simple, but you know, as we tried to capture uh, a larger and larger market and support more and more activities, our software started getting more and more complex. And at some point. Uh, people started worrying about the bloat in our software and the uh, and the complexity of use. It was in, it started becoming very very difficult for people to do even basic operations uh, with our software. Um, uh, Microsoft at some point performed measurements of how much of the content, how much uh, how much of the functionality was being used by any single person, and most people used five to ten percent. Of the capabilities used uh, available uh, in Microsoft Office, the problem was that every person used different five to ten percent. So really, all of this capability was needed, but any individual person could have used a much simpler, personalized version of the software. So Microsoft experimented with uh, this design. I'm not sure how many of you remember this. This is Microsoft Smart Menus. The idea again was that any one person needed only a fraction of the uh, of the functionality. So, so the, the menus would contain things that, that were predetermined to be commonly used and things that a particular individual has used recently and things that were uncommon and this person has not used would, would disappear. And they would only appear if a person explicitly clicked on this expansion bar or if they started hovering across, across the, the menu uh, apparently looking for something, then uh, then all of the menus would expand. Roughly half of the uh, Microsoft Office users hated this design and eventually it disappeared. But it illustrates that uh, both industry and researchers at some point took the software blog very seriously and were looking for ways of uh, making uh, personalized adaptations to the presentation of the software such that all of the capability would still be there, but the individual experience would somehow be simplified. Uh, lots of different things were tried. Uh, the approach that we, uh, as a field, seem to have settled on is what uh, I, I call split user interfaces, in which uh, a part of the user interface is explicitly designated as containing adaptive content. You can perform anything you want using the, the standard static interface that sometimes will require you to make five clicks to, to get to any piece of um, functionality, but there's also this alternative of being able to perform things more efficiently. The recently used fonts are copied to the top of the menu. Uh, you've got shortcuts for, for making your typing more efficient. You've got shortcuts to applications that may be you know, on, uh, on, on a different screen. So uh, we evaluated this design long, long time ago and generally found that people were both more effective efficient with it and and preferred it so uh, those of you who do experimental HCI know that getting both performance uh, and uh, and satisfaction up uh, with a single design is, uh, is not easy so this is generally a very good idea and we, we assume that that we have a win 
Um, we did observe, like many others, that nobody used these adaptive capabilities 100% of the time. It was mostly like, you know, probably 80% of the time people seem to be using it. We didn't pay attention to it all that much. Except at, at some point, we decided to, to revisit that behavior and try to understand it. But before I explain the, the results, I need to introduce the concept of need for cognition. Need for cognition is a stable personality trait, trait that captures how much a person enjoys engaging in effortful cognitive activities. If you don't have to think, how much do you enjoy thinking if nobody forces you to do it? And we designed an experiment in which there was, the, on the left-hand side, there is a standard you know, unchanging user interface where accessing any element takes two clicks, one to open the menu and one to, to make a selection. And then there is also the adaptive user interface, adaptive panel that whose contents keep changing and uh, where you can, if it has the right element, the element that we are seeking, you can perform the selection with just one click. And, uh, and people are shown what, what they're supposed to select. So this is really, uh, this design is measuring how, how efficiently people can operate the user interface uh, if they do not have to think about the task. Now, the results were very interesting. When we disaggregated them by need for cognition on a scale from one to five, people with high need for cognition were much more likely to take advantage of the adaptive shortcuts than people with low need for cognition. Essentially, what this is showing us that is that scanning the content of this menu, thinking like, is the right thing, is the thing that I need over there, directing your attention over there, and then making the decision that you want to use the adaptive menu instead of the static user interface is a form of labor. You have to, you have to uh, devote some attention and some cognitive resources to, uh, to, to performing this task. So we thought when we, as a community, when we designed split user interfaces that we came up with a way of effortlessly saving people uh, work by giving them easily accessible shortcuts. But instead, what we seem to have done is trade one kind of labor for another. And this is particularly visible for people with low need for cognition, for whom the cost of performing this attention switch and, uh, uh, and decision making was so large that they often chose to perform two clicks instead of one click on a little bit of thing. So this is the first indication in my talk that, uh, that we overestimated how much cognition people are willing to, to develop to our task and underestimated how much effort it takes to, to take advantage of something that we need. Now, chapter two, we'll look at predictive text. And here, what we discovered is that a tool that we designed ostensibly just to make people more efficient uh, in writing what they wanted to write actually changes what people write. We did not anticipate. Uh, here is an, uh, an experimental setup. People are given uh, a keyboard. And in our experiments, in some conditions, people did or did not have this uh, predictive toolbar. And the task was to write captions uh, for, for images. And before I show you the results, we'll use the word predictable uh, in the context of a word typed by a person if it would have been one of the words suggested by the predictive text algorithm. In, in all conditions, we, the algorithm was running in the background, so we knew what next word it would have uh, predicted. So we, we could tell uh, whether someone wrote a predictive, predictable word, even if they were using, uh, even if they were in a condition without predictive text being visible. So the first result is perhaps not surprising, and that's um, people who, who saw the, the text predictions, word predictions, wrote more predictive. So, you know, when they probably when they were given a choice between the word that they initially thought of and uh, and the near substitute, they chose a near substitute because it saved them some work. No big surprise there. A bigger surprise is that people who were given predictive text wrote actually shorter captions than people who were not given predictive text. And that's uh, <coughs> because we felt that these people would be more efficient and perhaps would write more because it would take them less effort. So to understand the first result, indeed, what we saw was that when people had a particular word in mind, for example, a person was planning to write the word approaching, but they saw the word on, they chose whatever was, was, uh, was given by the predictive text because it saved them somewhere. No surprise there. What, uh, what happened 
the other thing that happened though was that the predictive text was unlikely to, to offer uh, adjectives, adverbs, or other embellishments. So this is why people ended up writing shorter captions because, for example, a person might have thought, all right, a train is approaching an outdoor station, but the predictive text was unlikely to, to offer the word outdoor, so people would just skip to the word station. Um, so we, we had these kinds of uh, effects on people's writing. In another experiment, we also looked what happens if the corpus that was used to train the predictive text is biased. Specifically, we, we trained two predictive text algorithms. One, one both were trained on uh, restaurant reviews corpora, and one was trained on a corpus that emphasized positive reviews and one that emphasized negative reviews. So one was skewed toward positive valence and, and one toward negative valence. Uh, in the experiment, we invited people to the lab and we asked them to list four recent restaurant experiences two that they really enjoyed and two that they didn't. So they wrote down those experiences and they assigned star ratings at that point. Then we randomized the restaurant experiences into, into different predictive text conditions. One positive experience and one negative experience got randomized to, to, to a variant trained on positive corpus, one trained to a negative corpus. Then people wrote their reviews and remember they already committed to to, you know, to, to the star ratings and they said this was a good experience, this was a bad experience. And then we had independent writers read those reviews and assign star ratings to those reviews based on the contents without having seen the actual star rating uh, assigned by the original person. And the difference in the perceived star ratings was 0.4 stars. So people who wrote uh, who wrote reviews with the uh, with the predictive text based on the positive corpus wrote uh, wrote reviews that appeared more positive than people who wrote reviews uh, using the negatively skewed corpus. So again, another piece of evidence that we uh, that uh, that these algorithms affect what people write. Um, and for for our today's discussion, this is important because. Uh, I think our starting point when, when building predictive text tools was that users are rational beings, that they have full control over what they want to write, that all we are doing is giving them tools to be more effective at what they're doing, and that they clearly won't be swayed by such silly things as, uh, as word suggestions. But it turns out that we're actually substantially affecting what people write. Um, so now let's move on to, to the uh, currently very a timely topic, which is AI assisted decision making, um, and to review the progress that we've made this so far. Uh, there are many different situations in which AI assisted decision making is applied. So let me explain what specific example I have in mind when I'm uh, when I'm discussing this topic. I'm specifically imagining a doctor in a in a health encounter with a patient trying to make a treatment decision. Uh, in our work, we worked uh, a lot with psychiatrists and PCPs, primary care physicians, making uh, antidepressant prescriptions, specifically for patients who already tried one or two uh, treatments that didn't work for them. So now they have to move on to like third and fourth. Uh, and those decisions become quite difficult because the obvious ones have been tried. So uh, now it's harder to decide what, what should be tried next. And in these settings, the, the standard simple explainable approach is that, uh, that the decision maker is presented with a decision task. They are given some sort of a model pred prediction generated by the model that suggests what should be done and an explanation of, uh, of these uh, uh, decision recommendations. And then they, they are tasked with making a decision of their own. When our field started working on AI assisted decision making, uh, the obvious expectation shared by everyone was that people supported by AIs would perform much better than, than, than machines or people alone. And uh, you know, this kind of, anyone who has worked on ensemble classifiers understands the principle when we combine several systems that make independent mistakes. And when we combine their reasoning together, we always get something that performs as well or better than, than any of the components of, of such an ensemble. So this is clearly what should have happened. However, most of the uh, evaluations that 
that looked at how explainable AI performs in the context of actual decision making found results that look more like this. We often do a little bit better than people alone, but we never beat the AI in situations where the AI is better than, uh, than unaided people. We get some insight into what's going on when we disaggregate the results, looking separately at what happens when the AI makes correct versus incorrect recommendations. And we start seeing here some evidence of human over-reliance on, uh, on the AI's assistance. When people are given incorrect AI recommendations, they do worse than they would have done on their own, presumably because they end up not trusting themselves and end up following AI's recommendations when they shouldn't. Um, many people conducted such experiments. Uh, we conducted one with uh, psychiatrists and primary care physicians. Uh, when clinicians were given just AI recommendations, they on average performed as well as they would have without any assistance at the beginning. We see evidence of over reliance. And when we tried two different kinds of explanations, uh, the results were the same. So, in, in our, in our uh, design, uh, people with assisted by AIs performed no better than without the assistance, and there was no positive uh, effect of explanations. Now, our working theory at this point is that um, we, we result to the uh, dual system. Uh, cognitive processing theories for, for understanding what's happening. Uh, most of you have probably heard of those. We, we've got the fast heuristic system that is a statistical integrator and a pattern co completion system that is slow to train but very easy to, uh, to, uh, to reason with. And then there is the system two, which is uh, analytical slow, uh, uh, deals, can deal with novel evidence, and, uh, uh, but is also very effortful. In the kinds of decisions that we are discussing, where doctors are making treatment decisions, we would like them to, to work in system two, but it seems that they process AI generated information using system one. What's worse, they uh, evidence from some work, for example, from Gag and Bansal, which some of you have quoted in our conversations today, um, suggests that people do not even process the content of the explanations, but they process the mere existence of the explanations as a signal of systems, systems competence. So just because the system generates explanations, people uh, use uh, in such a way that they end up over relying on the system more without the benefiting from the content of what the AI system is saying. So our working theory at this point is that human cognitive engagement with the AI generated content um, moderates the effectiveness of, of the explanation. So unless we get people to, to to uh, engage with, with what the AI is saying, it really doesn't matter how beautiful your uh, explanations are. So if it is quite obvious from studies involving uh, actual human decision making that, you know, that the reality of AI decision making is not super bright, how come this is the story that we still keep seeing in papers and in media? And the reason for it, I believe, is that a lot of the uh, assessments of innovations in ex explainable AI use, uh, 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 use wrong uh, assessment methods. Maybe a quick question. On the, the last result, I get that uh, when people know it's an AI, they behave in this way. Is that, you know, is that result robust when people think it's Bob says this and this is Bob's explanation? Do people behave in the same way in trusting it because Bob had an explanation? Or is it? Different when you tell them to come to an AI versus a person. Uh, I'm not sure if it matters. I, I'm not sure if that. So if if you were if I had the problem and I came to you and you helped me with the problem, I would probably engage with what you're saying. But I don't know if it's just because it comes from math and not from the AI. I think there is more to our interaction than than just the source of it. I don't think. I don't think you would come to me and immediately say, do this. You would probably try to work with me through the problem. Through the problem. You would ask me about my reasoning. You would explain you know, how you would weigh the situation. And we would together uh, engage with the evidence and with the problem. And you would guide me towards what you believed was, was a better way of doing it. So I think that there are several factors that distinguish how you interact with me. So you know, math-assisted decision-making versus AI-assisted decision-making. 
try to touch on it uh, again a, a little later. So I believe that we, we have an overly rosy, we as a field again, a perception of how much progress we have made with uh, explainable AI because we've been measuring wrong things. So in particular, many uh, uh, explainable AI innovations have been evaluated using proxy tasks. In proxy tasks, people are told uh, a, a, a decision problem. They are shown a model explanation or some of their given some insight, some representation of the model or, or, or an explanation that it produces. And then the question that they're given is, what do you think the model will predict given what we've revealed to you about the model through uh, opening up the black box or by, by presenting the explanation? These are actually pretty good tasks for uh, trying to evaluate whether it is possible through a particular representation for people to build a model of how the system works and you know, uh, you know, uh, evaluating the possibility of the explainability of, of, of the model. However, these tasks are different from the actual decision tasks where people are given a uh, decision challenge and in explainable AI settings, model prediction explanation, and then they're asked, what, what decision should you make, right? So here the question is, what decision will the model make? And here it is, what, what is the right decision? Now, we conducted an experiment in which we compared two different kinds of uh, explanation approaches under two different settings. In one, we used proxy tasks, and in one, we asked people to make actual, uh, uh, actual decisions. When we asked people to, to predict the model's behavior, we got one set of results, clearly uh, uh, favoring inductive explanations. When we, when we focused people's attention on making actual decisions, the results were exactly the opposite. Uh, what we posit is happening over here is that, uh, remember, I argued that uh, human cognitive engagement moderates the effectiveness of the AI generated content. And what happens with proxy tasks is that we artificially focus people's attention on the performance of the model. We play with people's uh, uh, cognitive, cognitive engagement that is unrealistic and totally not representative of what happens when, uh, when people's job is to make actual decision rather than to predict the behavior of the model. So this is why I believe that the proxy tasks are not predictable of the, the, the success of these different approaches in actual decision making settings. Now, I told you there's going to be a narrative arc. We had a bit of, of a depression. Now there is going to be um, some good news for a moment. Um, so if we believe that we are working with this uh, uh, dual system regime where we've got a, a heuristic system that people seem to use inappropriately in this situation and an analytical system that they should be using but don't, what if we intervene somehow at the decision-making uh, time to nudge people to push them toward, toward the uh, more analytical processing of what's going on? We, uh, in the uh, clinical decision-making literature, we found the concept of cognitive forcing functions uh, because even without the interference of AI, doctors uh, uh, just have so many decision-making responsibilities that at times they, uh, they defer inappropriately defer to system one and do not appropriately engage with all of the evidence of their human. Uh, and we borrowed some of these interventions and decided to use them uh, in our setting. One example of a cognitive forcing function is to first present a person with a decision task without providing them with any additional aid. A person makes an initial decision, and at that point, they are told, and this is what the AI suggests for the following reasons. And if, if there is, particularly if there is a difference between what the person thought of and what the AI suggests, we we uh, anticipated that people would uh, perceive this dissonance and will want to investigate why there is a difference between what they thought and what the system is suggesting and would more deeply uh, engage. And indeed, when we uh, looked at the data, um, we are now just looking at what happens when the AI is making incorrect uh, suggestions. So we are looking at the amount of over-reliance present. Uh, present. Uh, 
when people were just getting the standard uh, decision recommendations with explanations, there was huge over reliance uh, on the system. Uh, when we uh, when we applied the cognitive forcing functions, the over reliance got substantially and significantly reduced, though not entirely eliminated. So this seems like a pretty good outcome. And our working theory at this point is that simple explainable AI uh, results in only very minimum human cognitive engagement with the AI generated content. But when we apply cognitive forcing functions, this uh, engagement gets increased and we get better, larger benefits of the AI assistance. Now, uh, unfortunately, there is a setback. Um, we we work with this idea of cognitive forcing functions and try to interrogate it from several different directions. Uh, another setting in which we tried it was online dating. Uh, specifically, uh, we looked at the effect of implicit bias on human decision making in online, online dating. A standard, uh, a very common design for online dating uh, uh, platforms is to present people with profiles of potential uh, people that a person might choose to uh, hang out with. And uh, a user is encouraged to very quickly respond to these suggestions by swiping left if they dislike the profile or swiping right uh, if they do. And often these profiles are presented with superficial information first with some additional um, substantive information available on the map. We thought that because the, this design emphasizes superficial information and very quick decision making that it would exacerbate the effects of human uh, implicit biases and we, we thought that we would check that and then also see whether uh, redesigns might result uh, in reduction of, of the implicit bias so we tried the uh, the cognitive forcing function design that i showed you before a person is presented with a uh, with a profile. They decide whether they think they like it or not. And at that point, they say, you know, the algorithmic match is twenty percent with this profile. You know, given this extra information, do you want to reevaluate the decision? And then the last design that we tried is one in which we reverse the order of information. So the initial piece of information that the person sees is answers to the substantive questions that the person said are important to me uh, in a potential uh, match. And people would have to scroll to see the most superficial information, such as a person's picture or and, and, uh, name. And what we found, we specifically measured people's uh, racial bias, and we specifically measured it for people who, so at the very end of the study, we asked people, was race a factor in your decision making? And roughly half of the people said yes, and half of the people said no, we, I did not rely or did not intend to rely on race in my decision making. In the standard uh, interface, we found very strong evidence of, of uh, racial bias in people's decision making. So I should mention that our profiles were uh, algorithmically created, meaning that the faces were, were created by, uh, uh, by, by a uh, deep a deep learning system, and they were controlled for apparent age, facial expression, pose, and we also run uh, another pre-study uh, with a large number of people to uh, for perceived attractiveness. So all of these faces came from three different uh, races: white, East Asian, and, and black. They were supposed to be all comparable. People saw comparable faces of different races with same levels of uh, alignment with uh, with a kind of substantive requirements, and comparing comparing people's responses to to black versus white profiles that were otherwise identical, we saw that even people who said that they did not use a race in their decision making, they made um, uh, racially biased decisions. The cognitive forcing function design slightly reduced the the apparent bias, but the, the reduction was not statistically significant. The condition that resulted in substantial and significant reduction in the, in the bias was the one where people saw substantive information first and superficial information later. So this was a bit of a setback because we thought that if people engaged uh, 
substantively and analytically with the with the profiles, we would see much larger reduction in the in the effect of implicit bias on decision making. So this gave us uh, an idea that uh, that the cognitive forcing functions perhaps are not working the way we we expect. Then we conducted another study where we probed cognitive engagement through a different uh, measurement, and we found some additional negative evidence and another good one of hope. So here, coming back to the question, what is the difference between math-assisted decision-making versus AI-assisted decision-making? Uh, if I ask a colleague for help and they assist me with a, with a complex task, I would probably do better in the moment on that particular task, and I would learn something from the interaction and do better in the future, right? And there's a lot of evidence that such incidental learning occurs a lot in, in organizations and that uh, by some estimates, roughly half of the learning in real world organizations happens through incidental learning when, when uh, co-workers interact with one another and assist one another in their situations. Uh, but the important thing is that learning only occurs if there's cognitive engagement. We have to engage with the material for us to, to learn from. So we decided to conduct a study in which people would interact uh, uh, with, uh, uh, with decision-making tasks, and they would do it, they would interact with tasks that required the same underlying concepts multiple times. So that we could learn, learn, we could measure how much people knew ahead of time, then we could intervene, and then we could measure how much they knew at the end of the study. And our working theory at this point is that simple explainable AI designs where we just give people uh, a decision recommendation and explanation do not result in much cognitive engagement. Therefore, we would see very minimal incidental learning, whereas cognitive forcing functions do uh, result in cognitive engagement. So we would see evidence of learning. The task that we designed was one in which people saw pairs of meals and they were asked, you know, does which of the meals has more protein or carbohydrates or fiber uh, or fat? Then in the baseline condition, people received no assistance. In the simple explainable AI condition, people were, were shown a decision recommendation and a very nice, succinct, contrastive explanation that only fo focused on the uh, important difference between the two meals uh, and people made their decision and they received no additional feedback uh, and in the update condition people would first make their decision then the system would say hey this is what I think you have a chance to revise your decision if you want. Uh, at this point I should uh, explain what our two base baselines were uh, in the no support baseline people just got the decision making task and were told you know tell us what you think, and they got no feedback. And so this, uh, this baseline essentially creates no opportunities for learning, except for a repeated uh, exposure to, to a concept. So this is our low baseline. We expect that nobody will perform significantly worse than this. This baseline came from, from a prior study, uh, and here people made a decision unassisted, but then they got an ex they got the response that said you were correct or incorrect, and this is why. So they would get uh, actually exactly the same explanation as they as they got uh, in the explainable AI condition. The explanations were designed to be uh, identical. And in the simple explainable AI condition, as expected, we, we saw no evidence of learning, right? People perform as, as poorly as in, the, um, as in the low baseline. And unfortunately, in the cognitive forcing function condition, people also perceived, performed uh, in a way that was not significantly different from the, from the low baseline. There was no evidence of learning over here. So we tried another approach inspired by work from Perry Carhelius' group, in which they worked on how much people learn from interacting with um, GPS systems. What they found was that if people are given a GPS that, tell, that tells them you are here, and that's it, and people have to make their own decisions about when and where to turn, people get to their destinations uh, efficiently, and they, they build a mental model of their surroundings, they learn their surroundings. 
if people are given a map that does a you are here now turn left people get to their destinations and learn nothing about their surroundings so we tried something similar we gave people the explanations but we did not tell them we did not give them explicit decision recommendations because the explanations were uh, it was quite easy to to decide you know to translate the explanation into a decision so here it says beans are a significant source of carbohydrates we look at these two things you know, there are lots of beans over here yeah okay it makes sense this should be the this should be the meal with more car carbohydrates so the amount of cognitive processing cognitive effort required to go from this uh, explanation to a decision is quite minimal but people still have to do it on their own and this minimal amount of effort was enough to, to create enough cognitive engagement with materials so that people learn as much in this condition as they did in our high baseline where people were given uh, expert explanations. Now, this brings me to, to the final chapter. So, uh, quick, quick question there. How, how is learning measured? I, I wasn't following. Oh, um, so. In this case, the, the concept is that the beans are a source of carbohydrates. People were presented with three tasks where this concept was relevant. The first time, they received no assistance and no feedback. So we just learned whether they knew the concept. Okay, so those are the leftmost columns in the graphs. Uh, no. Oh, okay. So I, I'll explain that in a second. Then the second interaction was some intervention. And one of those interventions could be nothing. So that was the leftmost column. Thing. Then the third interaction was when we when we gave people no assistance and we measured how much did, did they know at this point after the after the intervention. So, uh, so if the middle interaction was was nothing, people still learned a little bit just because they interacted with the concept three times. But if in the middle interaction they received expert feedback, they, they actually learned that we're able to, to do better in the future. And if the AI gave them explanation, but no decision recommendation, they also learned. So now, um, so what, uh, what a lot of our work has started to reveal is that anytime we poke at something that we that we as a community are taking for granted it turns out to be wrong it turns out to be an unexamined assumption so when we looked at how we evaluate the systems with with proxy tasks it turns out to be not a particularly informative uh, thing if we want to predict how people will do on actual decision making tasks when we looked at our field's decision to give people decision recommendation it turns out that this is probably a fairly random decision that does not really help people make better and more important decisions. Uh, so now we're, we're stepping back and we conducted a study in which uh, we co-designed a decision support systems with clinicians uh, and analyzed the conversations that occurred to try to find out you know, what, what, uh, what might be, uh, what other decisions we might be making that are um, uh, that, that need to be re-examined. So one thing that we heard over and over again is that doctors actually do not want to be responsible for the oversight of the algorithms. When the algorithm tells them something, they do not want to be asked to think, you know, will it kill my patient? Uh, they believe that anything that enters medical practice needs to be rigorously tested on the impact that it has on medical practice uh, so it's not just enough to test the you know, predictive power of the algorithm. Uh, an AI-based decision support system has to be evaluated in a clinical setting, and the outcome needs to be the decisions or the you know, impacts on the patients. So they believe that anything that enters clinical practice needs to meet certain uh, standards, right? It cannot kill patients. However, and this we, we have trouble with, at first, they say that on some occasions they do want to see the explanations generated by the system, particularly if the system uh, makes an unusual recommendation. And in our, in our case, we worked with patients who are quite complex in that uh, they've already failed to, to respond to, to two or three uh, treatments. So now we have to find 
something more interesting. So they were not covered well by clinical guidelines. So sometimes the system would say something a little bit surprising. It would say, hey, typically a patient with this with these kinds of characteristics should be uh, should be prescribed this kind of treatment, but because this patient's uh, situation differs in this one factor, instead data suggests that you should uh, consider a slightly different treatment. So doctors were, did, did not want to be responsible for the oversight, but they were open to the insight. And this made, must, made us realize that in many situations, we are presenting people with two simultaneous challenges that probably cannot be addressed uh, at, together. So we tell doctors, you are given a system that, was, that is capable of finding nuanced patterns in the data that will make recommendations that go beyond standard clinical guidelines and clinical practice. And when the system tells you something surprising, it is your job to decide whether it's extreme stupidity that will kill your patient or whether it is extreme brilliance that will heal your patient. patient. Uh, we posit that in most situations, you cannot do both things at once. Uh, so we really need to uh, re-examine our assumptions about who is responsible for, uh, for the bad behavior of, of the algorithm. And Ben Green has a fantastic uh, essay arguing that the reason why we ask the doctors or other decision makers to perform the oversight duties, duties is because the creators of the algorithms and the uh, uh, administrators who make purchasing decisions uh, are not willing to be accountable for, for, for the decisions that they make. That this is essentially shifting of it, accountability. Now, another uh, insight that came from the uh, conversations with the doctors is that modern medicine strives for shared decision making, particularly in situations where patients' preferences may be an important factor for, for making decisions. So this is really the case for, uh, for mental health treatment decisions, because you have to think very carefully about side effects. You also have to think about how demanding different regimes are. Do you take the pills once a day or, or three times a day? Are you capable of taking them three times a day? But we design our decision support systems for the doctors. So what we are doing, we are intervening in the health encounter in such a way that the patient, the doctor is trying to build a relationship with the doctor, with the doctor is trying to build a relationship with the patient, a relationship that is essential for patient activation and therefore for patient's compliance and success. And we take the doctor's attention and eyes away from the patient and to the computer where they spend a couple of minutes and return to the patient. Instead, what we should be doing is planning from the very beginning for shared decision making. <laughs> which can have uh, consequences for what information we present and how. Uh, it's not just the vocabulary that we choose to communicate the information, but patients will probably have very different responses to, to any notions of uncertainty. Uh, so there are both interesting design and potential algorithmic challenges involved in designing for shared decision making. And more broadly, uh, I think we should uh, uh, we should be open to re-examining this seemingly fundamental uh, assumptions in our field to make sure that they are the right assumptions for the evaluation. So to summarize, um, the field of HCI knows that we should be gentle with the cognitive uh, demands that we place on our people. We started des designing smart interactive systems, seemingly in the hope of making lives easier for the people, but in that process, we often made uh, uh, wrong uh, assumptions about how much cognitive effort we're demanding of people and how much they are willing to give us, and uh, uh, and to our own detriment because our systems ended up being less effective than uh, than we hoped they would. Be. Uh, and specifically in AI-assisted decision making, we thought that people assisted by AIs would perform better than. Uh, either people or AIs alone, but, but people don't. And it's probably um, because we overestimate how much cognitive uh, uh, engagement people are, are willing to, to give us when uh, consuming the information generated by the AI. We thought we were making much better progress than, than we actually did because we are measuring the wrong things. And uh, in general, there are many unexamined assumptions in. Uh, 
in the current designs of human AI interaction that we really should step back, uh, you know, interrogate uh, and potentially redesign from scratch if our uh, our objective is to make the world a better place. So lots of people contributed to this work. I highlight those who led some of the projects they shared. Questions? Hi, I am Suyong Lee. Um, and as I introduced briefly, I am working on you know, like people's research and behavior research. So this, I really enjoyed your talk because a really long time ago, I actually uh, did small study looking at why people are not making a lot of effort in searching. Uh, there's actually kind of my title, right? And then, um, so this is very kind of like, you know, I was kind of going back to that research. Um, I think that what comes to, it's like, I think that I really agree on a lot of like assumptions that, you know, like that you pointed out. But your sort of example is one is in most sort of like a clinical setting where um, the stake is really high, right? It's like making wrong decisions is really high versus some of the examples is like a dating sites, right? Where people are making really quick decisions without necessarily, you know, um, going into deeper sort of analytical thinking. So I think that it really sort of goes back to the, what kind of weird task, right? And then what are the weird consequences of making decisions based on this AI assisted system? So. I don't know whether we can make some comments because like a medical context versus dating app is very different, but can you kind of like think of some, you know, based on your sort of previous study, how you see the kind of a relationship between this is taken consequences and impact of making certain decision versus, you know, this is something the stake is so low and that they are not really necessarily engaging the, you know, um, engagement. Um, so first, I'll channel Zillin, who worked, who led the work on, on dating. Uh, he taught me that uh, uh, racism in uh, intimate decision making actually has tremendous societal impact. So these are not low stakes decisions. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I, I think the big question that you're asking is, what is the taxonomy of the space of human AI interaction and how, how do our results generalize? Yeah, like, right, well, depending on the different topic, depending on the different context. So my, my assumption going into this space was that the stakes were one of the important factors. Now I am not so sure. It seems so just reviewing the decision, the literature on clinical decision making, we can see that even without the AI, there's uh, a lot of issues with clinical decision making with doctors being tired, falling back on the heuristic systems, not making perfect decisions. So just because a decision is high stakes doesn't mean that people automatically engage or do, do it well. Uh, so I'm, I'm not sure if this is a key factor in our stakes. I think one factor that is important is whether the AI is supposed to automate, is supposed to imitate current human performance. So it's supposed to make things a little bit faster and less effortful, but not do more than we currently do, or whether the AI is supposed to exceed human capabilities. So in the, in the example of the uh, uh, assisting clinicians, the design is specifically to, to exceed human capabilities and to help doctors make good decisions in very unusual cases. There, there is other work that, um, Showed up in another in, in a few of our conferences on uh, assisting caseworkers in family interventions, and there the goal is to scour a lot of evidence available in disparate systems, synthesize it, and uh, save the caseworker time, but not make a better decision or different decision than the caseworker would. And I think and so in the latter case, we there is. We do not expect the caseworker to seek insight, and it would be possibly reasonable to, to for the caseworker to provide oversight. 
in a system that is ex supposed to exceed human capabilities, you cannot really expect uh, a decision maker to do both uh, oversight and be open to insight, right? So I, I think this is one dimension that is probably relevant. But uh, I believe that the immediate and urgent need of our community is to identify those, uh, those axes, those dimensions of, of that matter in the design of uh, human AI uh, interaction. And I do not think we, we know what those dimensions are. Jacek, you will monitor the chat, right? If, if I am but, uh, a first yeah, yeah. question. Um, I wanted just to clarify that oversight versus insight. Is that, is that, is oversight where the system says, I think you should do X, and then the doctor in this case has to decide whether or not to do X. If that's oversight and insight is some information, but without a candidate decision? No, it, it looks exactly the same. Okay. But oversight, um, I need to I need to detect whether the nuanced pattern that the system found is uh, is a real meaningful pattern in the data, or whether this is uh, this is an error, right? Like the the, the system you using wrong features, making wrong inferences, or something else. Right, so so I need to I need to decide whether this decision makes sense. Insight is me being open to to the nuanced pattern that is real, and me trying to decide. All right, huh? I didn't realize this relationship. It, I know or trust that it makes sense. Uh, I you know I. I believe that it was arrived at in, in, a, in a reasonable manner. And now I'm just trying to decide whether I'm willing to act at this novel, previously unknown information. So this so it almost sounds like insight results when people have a reasonable belief that the system has been appropriately calibrated and tested. Because that then drives with what you were saying about doctors expecting everything. <laughs> and that's why I'm saying that it is incredibly hard to perform both of these functions uh, at the same time, but right? because they're quite indistinguishable. So you need some guarantee that uh, uh, that the that the reasoning is sound. So what you mean, what you're saying there, is you can't tell people the system is going to give you insights. But I want you to think about whether those insights make sense, because that then makes it oversight. Um, or whether you trust these insights. Then this is a good question. So I think you you trust them. You but you can start asking. Uh, you know, do I believe that there is sufficient evidence? For me to to take leap, so I believe that the that the signal really exists in the data. Now, is it is it the right time for us to? And that's insight. That, that's a. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Oh, there's a lot more to think about. Yeah. Thank you. Who, who was next? So there is one question. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you're just. Um, uh, I want to ask, uh, like, uh, you have so several comparison groups, uh, like uh, with uh, AI only, uh, human only, and AI uh, plus human. So um, you measure their like learning scores, and I want to ask you, you measure like uh, uh, their subjective, like. Uh, um, Perception of like the usability of this, uh, like do they prefer um, AI only or AI plus human? Like because I think uh, in a previous project, Ian and I worked with, I met you during the launch, we designed that uh, Chrome extension that builds some credibility cues to the participants that during the interview, they like we don't have a credibility score like recommended by the uh, like kind of algorithm or something else. Uh, 
um, but they the interview is that they uh, they prefer like they want a credibility score uh, that the system will tell them like how like what the score of the credibility. So I, I think like um, and so what I want to ask is, um, although like uh, AI might uh, um, like AI plus human can. Um, assist people like learn more but in real life setting this uh, learning more is not always there like well it's not the only factor influence whether they choose to use this uh, system or not like say if we have one system uh, let's say that is um, ai only and one system like you need to work with ai to make a decision like how do you think they will choose um, so this is an important question because you know we, we can design fantastic uh, interactions, but if people choose not to use them, they, they will have no effect. Uh, and indeed, in one of the studies, we specifically measured people's uh, preferences and subjective uh, 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 assessments of, of effort, and we grabbed them at how well they performed. So we specifically looked at, at over-reliance and subjective effort. And what we found was that the greater subjective effort, that the more people felt that they had to work to, to interact with a particular design, the less they over relied. Mm -hmm. So, so the, the most effective designs were the least pleasant to the people. Yeah. Uh, so uh, this means that some of these interventions that we're that we're considering we may need to apply them very judici judiciously so for example assuming that the cognitive forcing functions actually worked the way we, we thought so by the way given the evidence that we have so far we fear that at least some of the cognitive forcing functions do not uh, really result in people um, engaging more with the information but with people shifting their bias from over relying on the ai to being more attached to the initial decision but if if something like cognitive forcing functions worked, we would, you know, perhaps one thing that we should do is apply them adaptively only in the cases where we are really worried that the person may over rely and not do it in cases where we believe that the human AI system would do the right thing, right? Just, just so as not to overburden the person if we do not have to. So we, we do have to worry about acceptability of these decisions. And there will often be a trade-off between effort and, and, and performance. Mm -hmm. Next, and then we have online questions. Maybe this is building on James' question. So again, in that system, uh, I think it was the IUI paper where you had the expert condition of whatever, 33%, and then this uh, other condition where you show the evidence and it's 34%, you know, the, 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 the better thing. There's the AI explanation, what's being termed AI explanation might a sense is oracle feedback actually. So you're saying here's the insight, you know, the insight to look at, but it's it's oracle. We have an infallible AI. And in a lot of the problem in practice, the reason why we have to have oversight is you know, if you had that, you know, you showed that tile of them where you say, well, so and so and so patients also have this, you don't respond to treatment, whatever, you know, um, what evidence did the AI use to get that? Did it, did it extract that correctly? Did it reason effectively over the multiple sources that was being integrated? There's this whole chain of provenance. Was the journal article later retracted that this was extracted from? And so it's, it's also, I think, not clear to me where that line is between oversight and insight. It's almost like this is the, quote, fourth paradigm of, of hypothesis, like science generation. You know, this is a hypothesis but you some, somebody still has to go and investigate and see if this is actually valid. Is this correlation or causation? You know, so. Was there a question? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so your slide here says AI explanation, and it's I think it's not AI. I think this is Oracle. I think there's so many things that are about the fact that AI is fallible that leads to the oversight thing. So I'm trying to understand the argument about insight versus oversight, because I think you have to have oversight versus I mean, insight too, because it's not necessarily reliable in practice. Okay. So in this design, we 
we simulated an, an AI that is 100% correct, but we told participants that it sometimes may, makes mistakes. We made it 100% correct because we wanted to create most favorable conditions for, for this simple explainable AI. We wanted to see if under you know, perfect AI performance and with the wonderfully crafted explanations, will, will simple explainable AI perform well? And it did. So I believe that our evidence is pretty strong that simple explainable AI is not sufficient. But because our conditions were so perfect, our evidence is not equally compelling for the value of, of this approach. Uh, uh, our, I believe the explanations that we created by hand are creatable by uh, automatically. And right, right now, in fact, we do have a project that creates succinct uh, contrastive explanations for situations where there are many possible things that the person may be thinking. Right? Because when you create a contrastive explanation, you, you have to say, this thing is better than this other thing that you are probably thinking. And you have to have a good idea about what the person may be thinking. So this is an interesting challenge. Uh, and we totally do not know what happens if the AI is reasoning when arriving at this explanation is incorrect. Because these explanations may be just so compelling, regardless of their correct, correctness, that they will mislead people. So uh, this is the very next thing that we want to investigate. Because can you have insight without oversight? I think that this is the dichotomy I'm struggling with. So I think there are reasonable and unreasonable mistakes that you can make. Uh, and uh, lethal and minor mistakes. And I think that we, we are responsible for making sure that the systems that we give people do not make unreasonable lethal mistakes. So there will I, I will always Need, I may always choose to challenge your reasoning to, to some extent and make decision. You know, is it is the evidence strong enough for me to base my decision on it? Uh, but I, I think there is a qualitative difference between such minor tweaks versus uh, also spotting things, uh, decisions, and recommendations that are based on faulty reasoning or decisions that can have catastrophic consequences. So it's a little bit like the distinction between somebody looking at the recommendations and sort of going, ah, you know, garbage in, garbage out. This is not even worth thinking about. Compared to getting advice from a conscientious colleague who you respect, you certainly could still be wrong. You could have missed something that you think about, and that they engage cognitively with the AI differently when they're when they're not saying things that are just like obviously wrong. And I can see that if you would engage differently cognitively. I just I'm having trouble thinking of this as a dichotomy uh, in terms of different types of mistakes. But, uh, but it, I think more, you know, perhaps it's not a dichotomy. Maybe it's a multi guided category. The point is that this is a, an axis worth thinking along as people are thinking about the system. I do have to admit that I thought about very extreme of. Of, of, of this range, and the distinction to me was clear, but I can't tell where exactly the line is. Um, but kind of slightly building on Matt's question, uh, recently in, in my undergraduate class, I asked students in, in preparation for a lecture to say, hey, think about the recent situation where you collaborated with someone on, uh, on making a decision. How do you, what, what, how do you like the, the interaction to look like? And essentially, nobody described what we do today. Uh, there were quite a few people who, who focused on the process. They said, I want to, to tell my process to someone, and I want them to react to my process, or I want them to, to walk me through a process. Some people said, who are you to give me advice? I want to understand you know, what, 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 is, uh, what, what you bring to the table and you know, why you are credible. And nobody said, you know, I want you to, to bring me an answer on the, on, on the platter with some throwaway explanation. Um, so just, just responding to, to, to your questions about uh, 
whether these contrastive explanations that we're given were the solution to human AI interaction. I don't think so. Now we have a last question is online from Jashin, who is our PhD student. Jashin, go ahead. Uh, hi there. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, first, thank you for sharing very interesting research. My question is pretty simple. So uh, in the picture, like uh, when you investigate the incidental learning, how did you measure it? So is it just like the accuracy of the task or you measure other things? Uh, just the performance on the tasks. And there okay. were quite a few concepts, so we averaged over many concepts per person. Okay, so what's your understanding of learning? Because um, my understanding is like, if you want someone to learn something, it means like he or she obtains some knowledge. And in the future, without the assistance of AI, they can still make some decisions on that. So that's my understanding of learning. So um, yeah, uh, I, I want to hear more about your opinion on that. So um, is it like you want to develop the AI assistant, like people will always use it to support the decision making, or you somehow hope that by the training from AI, people can get the independent ability and in more uh, context, they will make independent decisions. Uh, good question. So there were two motivations behind this work. So one was to, to use incidental learning as a window into people's cognitive engagement, because you cannot learn without cognitive engagement. So if you if you see if you see the evidence of learning, you are fairly confident that cognitive engagement occurs. Uh, but also, you know, we talk so much about human AI partnership, right? We say, hey, we have a colleague AI partner. So I want us to be accountable for the performance, right? If I work with a, with a human partner, it's not to help me make a better decision in the moment. I get other benefits from this partnership. And I don't just mean that it's, you know, a fun time to be, uh, you know, chatting with Matt. I, you know, I, I learn, right? This is a benefit that we expect in professional uh, settings from partners. And this benefit, I believe, is not occurring with the simple explainable AI. So I both wanted to, to, to have a new window into human cognitive engagement, a more objective window than what I previously had. And I also wanted to challenge the, this metaphor that we keep throwing, uh, throwing around without, uh, without checking if it, if, if it actually lives up to, to reality. Okay. Uh, thank you. Good comments. So that's all I'll ask. Thank you. Now we have a question from Hi. Hey. Um, so one of the things that I didn't really see is, uh, so most of these tasks are for short term tasks. What about thinking about things longitudinally? Because when you're talking about a decision support system in medicine, for instance, it's their experience over time that they, they say, okay, well, I relied on it before and absorbed or I relied on it before and it's failed me. Um, I think in your own, in one of the examples you gave it was about mental health. I used to work in psychiatric research. And in, in psychiatric research, you know, the DSM is a very algorithmic way of diagnosing disease, uh, mental health disorders. And doctors in many cases will say, oh, well, yeah, this is what the DSM says. But in this scenario, I ignore the DSM for this reason. And two of the most common reasons were because there were other intervening factors, or the second one was if I follow that, they won't get their insurance coverage. If I do something differently, I can get their insurance coverage for them. So they've learned to selectively distrust the algorithm, not AI in that case, it's an algorithm. Um, I can see again over time doctors saying, okay, well, in this sense, scenario, you all trusted it works well, but I'm going to selectively distrust it based on my long term experience. And the stuff you're looking at doesn't really look at it longitudinally, as I understand it. So, how, how might that change the thinking about how people interact with this over a longer period of time when you're talking about systems that, yeah, it's, it's a continuous series of feedback between the system and the person? Um. What, what I see as salient in your question is not the longitudinal aspect, but the socio-technical mm -hmm. aspect, you know, that there is more to the decision than the biochemical efficacy. Um, and there has been uh, a very interesting paper, again, from Ben Green, uh, 
uh, that demonstrated that even and the experiment was with bail uh, decisions that demonstrated that even if the recidivism recommendations are 100% correct, the mere presence of the system in the decision making process causes the decision makers to overvalue. Uh, put more weight on the recidivism prediction over all other factors that typically go into the bail decision. So bail, in bail decisions, recidivism prediction is only one component, and there are several others. If there's a computer system that predicts recidivism, we suddenly start assigning more input to that factor than to all others. So uh, I think another thing that we should be doing when we build decision support system systems is to uh, be very conscious of the factors that are important to a particular decision that are not captured in the system, and that the interactive system should surface both the prediction about the narrow aspect that the system is able to predict, but also make salient to the decision maker all of the other things that they should consider in their decision making process when they make their overall decision. And as you say, you know, success with insurance is a factor that doctors definitely use. There's also, you know, do I believe that there are the side effects? There's, you know, I do not believe this patient is, uh, you know, organized enough to take three pills a day. I'm going to give them something that takes only one pill a day. Um, and then there is also, uh, you know, prescribing the, and this is something that came up in, in our conversations with doctors, prescribing the, the medicine is not the only part of the treatment. If my system predicts this, person is unlikely to succeed essentially with anything, then I'm going to intervene by scheduling a follow-up in two weeks rather than in two months. Right? So, so there is a broader set of decisions that, that I can make if I consider a, a larger socio-technical system. Um, so, so yes, I believe all of these elements should be, if, even if they're not part of the AI component of the system, they should be part of the interactive systems, which is what people in this room are, are, are building. And longitudinal aspect is, uh, is, is an aspiration. So we have another question online uh, from another doctoral student in our program. Ujang, I'm here. You are raised a virtual head. Sorry. <laughs> Um, hi, Professor Apolia. Thank you for the great talk. Um, I have one question about human hand partnership. Uh, so I'm very curious, like um, when we talk about the term, we treat AI as a human counterpart, which means that in the decision making system, we I didn't make a decision, AI make a decision, and then we just select which one. Uh, so based on your talk, I have a different kind of like perspective. I consider it's not it is not a counterpart, it's more like we try to think about how AI could extract some useful information from the data set or they could provide some useful information. What I understand is AI explanations uh, to help user better uh, make a decision. So it's not really like a counterpart, it's like an information retrieval system. So we don't know actually what the black box AI is doing, but we try to use explanation as one way to extract some useful information from the black box to help AI uh, make a better decision. Um, that leads me to another way of thinking, and I'm just curious, like back into 1980 and 1990, when we talk about AI expert system, a lot of the study has been working on case-based reasoner, which means that AI do not make decisions. AI help you to find like to retrieve a, a, a very similar case and then let the human to make the decision. So my question is, why currently AI stood out in helping human make these decisions, and especially in the clinical context? So I just read a paper, it talked about that a CAD system didn't really work well for radiologists. And sometimes it made radiologists even difficult to, to, make, to, to make decisions. So one hypothesis is because AI is also trained to do what humans are already capable of doing, instead of focusing on what humans are not able to do. So if we can identify those sweet spots, we can better find the, the strength, like integrate the strength between both human and AI. So I was, so back to my first question, why do you consider now, there are a lot of studies, 
and focusing on uh, we, we need to think about how to better help like AI to make the decisions. Um, yeah. Um, not super sure what your question is, but I'll speak anyway. I'll speak to things that are interesting. Um, so uh, I, I also, you know, I, I got when I paused and started to ask myself, why do we give people decision recommendations? I started asking myself, how did we arrive at this decision? So I looked at the, all the literature on decision support systems, and many of those papers scream, do not give people a decision recommendation support their decision making process synthesize the information make it easier for them to make sense of the information but do not suggest a decision do not even hint at the decision um, uh, and somehow you know we've completely disregarded this this literature and we give people a decision and occasionally we we, we have them reason so uh, how did that occur i think it, it's happening because it's convenient because uh, we suddenly develop tools that are incredibly capable of, uh, of making predictions. Uh, the, the kinds of math that we've been working on in machine learning for, for several decades makes predictions, either categorical for classification or continuous flow for regression. Uh, and because th these were the tools that we had, this is what, what we gave to people and we designed the interactions for the strengths of the math that we had, not for the needs of, of people who use it. If we were to pause and think and redesign from scratch, we would design systems for, for information synthesis, for, for guiding people through the decision-making process, uh, for helping people uh, uh, you know, make cognitive sense of, 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 the, of the relevant evidence, and we would not be intervening by giving people uh, decisions. So, uh, convenience. Uh, by the way, uh, I should have said at the very beginning, uh, I, I, I'd rather you yelled at me than fell asleep. So I slightly <laughs> exaggerate my points throughout the talk, but not, not too much. <clears throat> Question uh, about the role of time. So, in, in your studies, uh, especially on uh, you know, smaller tasks, but also on more serious tasks like medical decision making, uh, do you have a sense of what role the time plays? And do, in your experiments, do you instruct explicitly, you know, you have uh, 30 seconds, one hour? Yeah, in our experiments, we do not play with time at all. We look at well, on one cognitive forcing function that we used was to force people to win, mm -hmm. but uh, otherwise we do not play with time. I think it is a factor when when the uh, when decisions have to make be made incredibly quickly. So Alexander Saritsevich uh, at Duke is working on decision support systems in uh, uh, for trauma patients, where decisions have to made be made in seconds, um, and that I think is a is a second factor that probably impacts uh, that we should use when reasoning about human AI interaction. So one factor is whether AI approximates or exceeds human capabilities, and the second one is uh, extreme time pressure versus not. I'm uh, saying there's no one online uh, <laughs> or both online. Um, what you're just talking about, I think, is, is, is really interesting with the idea of the, the decision support literature system. Yeah. Uh, hints at decisions. We've got you know, these systems that have learned only to give predictions. The next step, then, if we were to try to build systems that did the things that the expert systems literature said that we should be doing if we wanted good interactions with AI systems, should we, do we need to produce data sets about that show what a good synthesis is, right? Or show, it seems like we need to be producing data sets that are not the outcomes, but the, that's some intermediate quality element that is what the decision makers actually want. And if we can produce those data sets, 
uh, machine learners will chase after this and do amazing work in doing that. Um, I want to challenge this a little bit. Uh, so you are not the only person who, who came to me and said, you know, we, what we have to come up with is another benchmark so that all of these machine learning people, you know, all they have to do is press the button and they, you know, get the answer and, you know, we decide what the benchmark is. And if we find the right benchmark, they'll do the right thing. But all of this presumes that the machine learning people will only give us three seconds and that they will only respond to quantitative benchmarks that they can exceed, uh, that, 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 that are uh, you know, effortless for them to evaluate against. So we could create these synthesis data sets, or we could make it push for standard practice to, to involve evaluations with human decision makers. I, I think that the right thing is probably to do something in between to, to, to create some intermediate indicators of success so that people you know, can iterate faster, but not to the exclusion of studies that go all the way to, uh, to, to experimentation that involves actual decision makers. We, we should acknowledge the fact that we are working on something very important, societally impactful, and that to be accountable and responsible, we need to do it in an effortful manner. Uh, you know, I sit right next to students who, who live in the current machine learning uh, ecosystem and who are under pressure to publish a paper every three months. Um, yeah, so you chose ecosystem. I was thinking meat grinder, but yes, um, you chose ecosystem. Uh, and I, I, I think we, we've painted ourselves into a corner where, where we do essentially shoddy work. Um, a large quantity of, of, of shoddy work. And we need an AI system to make sense <laughs> of the work. But, but it seems like you're suggesting that the solution to that is to, to make people into field researchers, right? And uh, that seems like a very, a very difficult institutional design approach, right? We could introduce rules of conferences that uh, just increasing you know, F scores is not evidence of, of you know, an intellectual contribution, right? You have to actually show it being in the field, helping the people who you used as motivations for your work in the first two paragraphs. But then we just have to teach people how to do IRB applications. We have to teach them how to, you know, interact with, like, how to talk to people, how to talk to people, <laughs> right? How to convince leaders to like, implement studies and organizations. I mean, you know, I'm an organization scientist. Like that is that is really hard work. That is years of apprenticeship to know that stuff. Okay, so one of my approaches, you know, the in in HCA, the first thing that we say in the first lecture is that there's no such thing as user error. So this makes us a little bit humble, right? So there's no such thing as you know, if our machine learning colleagues are not doing things right, maybe we should think what we can do instead. I do not want to say that you know every single project has to have an extensive user study but perhaps if someone gets a five-year grant you know that there should be a user study somewhere um, i will also say that in 2008 i wrote a position paper for a usable ai workshop where i concluded that maybe we also need usable hci i reflected on the fact that there are more and more toolkits that make it very easy to, to apply uh, ai techniques and that hci folks are picking them up but we are not reciprocating, but creating by like creating uh, easy pathways for someone not familiar with the HCI to perform uh, a sensible uh, human subjects evaluation, right? Um, there are lots of nuanced decisions that typically go in, into a user study, but they're probably fairly repeatable patterns and we could make it much easier for people to, to go through this pattern. So some of it is on us to make it easier for, for our machine learning colleagues to do this high quality work, but not to the point of reducing it to, to a data set that they can, you know, that they can that they can be always excused from not talking to people. Thank you. Thank you for letting me helping with me. Thank you very much.